what is the, what is the best way for people to uh, approach sure that? Um, if someone is thinks that they have gynecomastia. it's not a big deal. Take a picture, send it to me. If it's something visible, I can tell them, yeah, you do or you don't. We get, on gynecomastia.org, a lot of um, the members will post a photograph and say, do I have it? Don't I have it? How severe? Things like that. Um, you can't all, with bodybuilder related gynecomastia, steroid related, you can't always see it. So, it, unless the nipple is really puffy, you know, if someone is a little fatter, they may feel a lump there, but it may be smooth looking because the fat sort of camouflages the gynecomastia. As you know, though, when you diet down, the lump becomes more obvious right. as the fat goes away. So telling someone, go ahead and diet down, see what it is, that works, but I actually don't like you dieted down to do the surgery. So you okay. don't need to be dieted down. You know, if you're obese is one thing, but you know, what you really want is a normal, wh where you live. That's where I like to see patients for their surgery. Right. And I can evaluate them then too. I mean, you can feel if there's a lump there. The history is very telling. Um, I have a lot of patients with just puffy nipples, young guys who come in and they say, yeah, it gets puffed up when I'm at the beach, this, that, the other thing. And then they come in the office, it's January and their nipples are tight and it's cold, so I can't see it. That's common, you know. But there are very few patients who are gonna come in and go to the expense and go to the trouble to see me just to tell me some story unless it's really going on right, <laughs> number right. one and um and i've seen enough patients to know okay is this something i can fix or is it something that you know a little diet and exercise will take care of right um the diet and exercise thing works if it's fatty related and interestingly some patients will come in and they haven't really had any changes they haven't taken anything but they may have used something in the past they may have had a little bit of gyno that they thought was not so bad. And then suddenly life changes a little bit. They get married, they have a kid, they have a job change or something. They're not working out, they're not dieting the same way. And suddenly it seems worse. And it sometimes hurts. And what I found is a number of those people, it's just their body fat going up and they become more aware of it. And it may be a little more uncomfortable. Sometimes it's rubs in shirts, so their yeah, nipples are yeah. sensitive. So a lot of factors come into play as to when someone presents. Uh, and how they present but you know the, simply if you think you have it ask you know and and i can take a look and tell you you know and then if if you have it if it's something that would resolve just with diet and some patients who where it's mostly fatty it will resolve the thing that i find though that in a lot of patients with gynecomastia or the propensity to develop gynecomastia is that this fat in this area is the sort of fat that we describe as abnormal fat it, it puts on the fat, it puts on weight as quick as it can and gives it up as slowly as possible. And so even patients who don't come in with a lot of you know, fat in their chest, maybe just a little puffy nipple, those patients I think are at risk for having a fatty chest if they got fatter. Right. You know, so this is their saddlebag or their love handle. Instead of you know, carrying their fat in a different spot, their chest is where they carry it. Yeah. So, People ask, well, why do you do liposuction on someone like Jose Raymond, you know, if you're doing a gynecomastia resection? And the reason is because that fat is there, whether you can see it or not. And I want to get rid of some of that because otherwise when you are not competing in bodybuilding and you're not, you know, four or five percent body fat or less, this, It'll blow up. this will show up and yeah. you'll see it. So I try to contour it prophylactically even if I can't see the fat. And that's why I don't want patients to come in in contest condition for their surgery. Oh, I want okay. them to be normal for their surgery because that's what I need to match. They're going to live there. They'll look great when they diet down, but if, they don't, if they're dieted down and then they cheese out, then again, they might have that little donut thing going on. Okay. So. Well, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So quickly give me a timeline of, of when someone comes in uh, for the surgery and then the recovery up until full bore 100% again. Sure. So I see a consult. We can get patients booked within two to six weeks and sometimes even quicker. I've had patients come in at the beginning of the week and we book them for Friday. I have some flexibility sometimes with my schedule like that and that works out fine. Um, so from the time you come in, we book the surgery. Uh, a couple of things prior to surgery, if you are someone who's using things, we like you to be off of any kind of supplements for at least six weeks beforehand. Um, you know, there are some things that contribute to bleeding, um, so those products should be discontinued two weeks ahead of time, any aspirin type or, you know, Motrin, things like that. 
Um, then uh, we have you do a couple things, clean with some special soap, things like that, you know, to try to minimize any risk of infection. The day of the surgery, I meet you at the surgery center. Take, the surgery takes about an hour and a half. Uh, I send you home with a vest, a you know, compression vest. I have you wear compression for four weeks after the surgery. You take it easy for those four weeks, but I let you get back to doing some cardio after a week. I let you do weight training, resistance training after two weeks. I just have you avoid doing chest exercises direct for four weeks. Um, so, you know, within uh, six weeks, you're almost looking pretty good. If you look on my website, any of the post-op photos of the regular run-of-the-mill Gonica Masters are typically taken six to eight weeks after surgery. So it looks pretty good at that point. Um, but from a contest perspective, I like you to have six months before you think about competing because there's swelling in the area. Um, that takes a little bit of time to resolve. In some patients, skin has to tighten up a little bit. That takes some time. Um, so all those things kind of come into play. Uh, but you're not sitting around doing nothing the whole time. You're back into your routine and within a matter of months, you're almost back to where you started before you had the surgery. That's awesome. Um, is there, can you tell us where to, to be able to reach you if... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm easy to get. Uh, ricksilverman.com will get you to my website. Um, and I'm also on Facebook. Uh, I'm on, I, I have a Twitter and an Instagram account, but I don't really know exactly what you I do. You do a bunch of stuff. before and afters on your Instagram. Wait, that, I, I know, I probably could do that. I, I have, my website people were excited <laughs> with your previous uh, video last week, and so, you know, we'll maybe get them to, they help okay. me out. Okay, yeah, we'll stuff, be able to put this up on yeah, that. we'll put this up there, too. Um, quickly, off topic, I'm sure mm -hmm. we're going to have another question for you, but there's something you do that is... Um, so admirable, yeah. admirable, whatever it is. <laughs> Something that I truly appreciate with, uh, from you is uh, that you're involved in this, uh, is it Project Smile? It's, it's, we call it Hands Across the World is our organization. It was started by one of my colleagues a couple years ago, but we go down to Ecuador every year and do cleft lip and palate surgery and hand reconstruction, burn reconstruction. And I just got back two weeks ago. Uh, I usually go the first week of February. You've um, been doing this every year. Since 1991. Unreal. Uh, I, I did this before I did a gynec master surgery. Yeah. So, and this is uh, all um, like like a charitable bono, thing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, you know, the attending surgeons and anesthesia staff and whatnot all contribute to pay our own way and then we raise money to cover our nursing staff and residents and whatnot. Um, typically we take between 25 and 30 people, um, usually get done 100 to 125 cases in five days of operating. Wow. So it's, it's a lot of work, but uh, Unbelievable. it's a great experience. So you're helping people be able to breathe, to eat, to, you know, avoid um, bacteria sure. in their face and, and yeah well with the with cleft lip and palate obviously there there are the social elements that you know being able to talk and look normal those are important things being able to eat getting rid of any openings between the mouth and the, the nasal cavity yeah. um, and we go back uh, we have two sites that we go to predominantly and we've been, we go back every year so the one town where we were this year we've been going since 1996 and uh, we operated on a young man, uh, 27 year old this year, who we operated on the first time when he was seven. And wow. so we've been taking care of him for 20 years. He was he had gasoline thrown on him and it was ignited by friends when he was a seven year old little boy. Four, I think he was four years old when that happened. And he says so he's got horrible. We released scars from his neck, and then we've done all sorts of work on his ears and a little bit on you know mostly on his face and neck and, and ears and whatnot. Um, we have a, a few patients where we've done these neck releases because they, they, I mean, it's very difficult. We have a, um, on our website for the um, charity, we have a really interesting 10 minute trailer, a little video um, that focuses on a woman for whom we did that. And um, it's just, you know, you need your Kleenex handy. But um, <laughs> when, when one of our, uh, call it, one of my colleagues was talking about it and describing what she wanted out of that operation, his comment, which is a real tearjerker, is she just wanted to be able to look up and see her kids play. And, you know, you think about something yeah, as simple yeah, yeah. as that, um, which she would have otherwise not had the opportunity yeah. to have that surgery. So. It's not vanity whatsoever. No, it's <laughs> to to yeah. try to do the basic things. Yeah. Well, that that's amazing, Rick. You know, Rick is 
not only an amazing surgeon, but an amazing guy with an amazing heart. And, and like I said, we've been friends for well over 20 years now. And um, uh, I thank you so much for allowing us to share this with, with people. Oh, and, um, you know, hopefully this will give people a better insight into, you know, what it is and, and how a, a simple fix it is. You know? It, you know, it is really pretty straightforward. It's really important, though, for particularly if they're bodybuilders, um, to understand that their best bet of getting it fixed is getting it fixed the first time, and their best bet of getting it fixed correctly the first time is someone who does this on a regular basis. Yeah. It's not a hard operation, but most plastic surgeons do one or two a year. Right. So they're really best off finding someone who does it on a regular basis. You know, I'm not saying cost shouldn't be an issue because you don't have to pet my, I'm not the most expensive guy out there and I'm not the most expensive guy in Boston. Um, you know, most of us who do this on, you know, and are reputable and do it on a regular basis are probably around a similar price, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people will pay here, it's, you know, pretty much seven, eight thousand bucks. Um, elsewhere in the city, they may pay 10 or 12, but, yeah. you know, uh, in, in New York, but, um, you know, other places they can find that's, you know, it, it will depend a little bit on the economy of where you are right. um, as to pricing. But um, it's worth doing that. And then the other factor is just being smart about supplementing afterwards. If they go through this, it's not something they want to do again. Right. And, you know, there's always a little bit of tissue left behind. And that's the, the key. People don't understand, you know, because they'll say, well, didn't you take it all out? You take everything out that you can, but we have to leave a little tissue under the nipple so the nipple stays alive and doesn't cave in, and that tissue can be stimulated again. So, okay, and also we don't want to leave out the women. Rick is—he's uh, <laughs> done tons and tons of uh, breast augmentations as well. So, yeah, for any of the ladies who uh, have big muscular chests, <laughs> come see Rick. Uh, I'm used to those. <laughs> He's the man. So. Um, yeah, that'll do it. I, I really appreciate your time, well, buddy. thank you. I appreciate you and coming We're going to get this up soon because everyone is asking. Awesome. We, we do get questions on a, on a daily basis regarding this. And uh, I've, been, I've been wanting to do something with you yeah, for, for quite some time now. And I thought this would be better than just a testimonial, you know, written I, on your website. I appreciate it. And, and like I say, anyone who has questions can email me directly. All right, awesome. You'll have that information. That's there. ricksilverman.com. This is the Boston Mass. Thanks again for watching. Now, if you're not subscribing, subscribe now. Tell all your friends to subscribe. If you haven't, do it now. All right?